under his eye has become a phrase that is now very well known in popular culture. Ever since Margaret Atwood's work of The Handmaid's Tale was adapted into a major TV series. And that introduced the world into what is, in my opinion, one of the most oppressive theocratic regimes in fantasy today. That being the Sons of Jacob from the Gilead Republic. And it is the topic of my discussion today. I would like to talk to you about theocracies. I would like to talk to you today about the kind of faith that gives rise to a theocracy. I would like to talk to you about theocracies and oppression and whether you can have one without the other. I'm also going to touch on theocracies where the God or the faith is actually outright evil or corrupt. And finally, I'm going to talk about governments that are influenced by religion as opposed to run by religion. My name is Marie Mullaney and this is Just In Time Worlds. If you would like to join in the conversation and talk about my book, my videos, or any other aspect of world building, there is a link down below to my Discord channel. And while you're clicking on that, don't forget to subscribe. Okay, let's get cracking. One of the interesting questions about a theocracy is, can you have a theocracy with a pantheon? Generally speaking, my answer would be no. I would argue that you would need either monotheism or maybe a small group of gods. And the reason why is because your big pantheons, like your Roman pantheons or your Greek pantheons, have got too much infighting amongst priests in order for there to be a single ruler that comes out of it. There's just too many factions to make an effective government. The only fantasy books where I've seen this pulled off is in Trudy Canavan's Age of the Five, where there is a pantheon of five gods and their priests are the government for the people. The reason why it works there is because the, these five gods have their own internal pecking order. There is a head god who is in charge and it is his priest who is also in charge of the government. They are also five fairly interfery gods who follow the same lines. They don't fight amongst themselves the way that the Roman gods fight amongst themselves. So it's a very unified pantheon. So if you're going to have a theocracy with a pantheon, that pantheon needs to be a tight-knit thing. It can't have huge divisions and arguments and family feuds, then it's not going to work as the core point of your government. There's just going to be too much infighting and it's eventually going to fall apart. That's why most theocracies is around a monotheistic god or maybe a very small group of gods. Now, here's an interesting question. Can a theocracy exist in a non-oppressive state? The answer is no, probably not. Even if your religion is a good religion, like with Mercedes Lackey's course, even if that is the case, it will still be an oppressive government. The reason why is because the first thing about this government is exclusionary. If you are not a priest, you cannot participate in the government. That naturally leads to an oppressive government. Your laws are not just laws. They are commands of God. They cannot be questioned. That leads to an oppressive government. Your government officials are not just government officials. They're also priests who look after the state of your soul and communicate with your God they are ordained and called to his higher purpose. Of course, it's going to be oppressive. You can't question a corrupt official. And that's why almost all theocracies are oppressive. Even a good theocracy has these flaws. Even a benign religion still says 
that if I'm a theocracy and you're not a priest or you don't believe in my God, then you can't participate in my government. If you don't believe in the same faith that I do, how am I going to tolerate that when I am the government who is also of that faith? It is a setup that absolutely goes into an oppressive form of government. Nowhere is this more clearly illustrated than in Warhammer 40k, where the government administrates the empire on behalf of the god emperor. And there is an entire order of inquisition dedicated to burn the heretic. They have space marines, they have inquisitors. There is no such thing as being an atheist in Warhammer 40k. You will burn at the stake for it. Honestly, it just is where a theocracy would end up. No matter how benign, if you cannot question the government, that's where you'll end up. So oppressive, sure. But does it always have to go to corruption? Not necessarily. And in my religion video, I did speak about the God interrupting corruption, which you can check out there under the theocracies model. And there I referenced Mercedes Lackey's course where the God cleansed the temple himself. You can also have a reform happen, a la what happened with the Catholic Church in our world, where Martin Luther started the Reformation movement due to the corruption of the Roman Catholic priests. And if you'd like me to talk more about how such a reformation would get started and how that would go down and the kind of ingredients you need to make that a rolling plot line, then comment down below, let me know, and I'll do a reformation and revolutions video. There is also a model of theocracy where the point is corruption. And that is a very interesting topic that I would like to talk about in terms of Jacqueline Carey's very unknown duology of Bane Reeker. Bane Reeker and Godslayer are a duology from Jacqueline Carey that is a retelling of the Lord of the Rings, but from Sauron's perspective. The theocracy formed under the dark shaper Satorus is one that welcomes evil people, and the story is told from the point of view of a guy whose backstory is that he murdered his wife and his king who had an affair and a child together. So they're a bunch of really nice guys, you know? The great thing about the way that Kerry told the story is that even though there's a dark side and a light side, by the end, you're not really sure that the dark side is that much worse than the light side even though the dark side has orcs and the light side has elves. So if you want to read a great perspective on evil theocracies from their internal point of view, as in writing the story from the villain's perspective, I highly recommend The Sundering. That might be a little dark for you, though. If you want to read the classic counterpoint of the good guys bringing down an evil theocracy, Lord of the Rings is, of course, J.R.R. Tolkien's telling of that story. However, I am not done with Kerry for this video. In the vein of opposing theocracies, I want to talk about Cushiel's avatar and the theocracy that the good guys battle against there. In order to do so, I have to spoil the book. So here is my spoiler warning. If you have not read Kashil's Avatar and you want to, use the chapters and jump ahead to governments influenced by religion now. Okay, here come the spoilers. The main premise of Kashil's Avatar is the rescue of the boy Imril from Drujan, which is the kingdom that lived and died. The Kashil series is a historical fantasy series, so the Drujan religion is based on Zoroastrianism. They used to worship Ahura Mazda and subscribe to the philosophy of good thoughts, good words, good deeds. They tried, however, to rebel against their overlord empire and they failed. The empire's response was disproportionately cruel and a ten-year-old boy was buried beneath a mountain of corpses but he survived. 
He was driven mad by the experience and he became the Markigar, and he led the people of Drujan to worship Angra Mayu, the dark half of Zoroastrianism's dual god. He wanted to conquer the world and give it to his dark god, and he ruled on the authority of that god. Against that dark power, Eloa, the god who espouses love of Terra de Ange, sent a courtesan, a swordsman, and a boy. And the story told in Kushil's avatar is how they won. And after they won, it's how their own gods guided them back to healing because that victory had cost all of them very dearly. To put it in modern terms, their PTSD was pretty severe. It's a great story about a non-expansionistic religion clashing against an evil and expansionistic theocracy and winning. If you want to tell that story from the hero's perspective, it's normally a story where the heroes come out smelling like roses, and indeed that is the case in Kashil's avatar. So we've talked about outright theocracies, but there is another form of government that I feel I should cover under this topic, which is a government influenced by religion. Nowhere is this more clearly illustrated than in our history in Europe of the Roman Catholic Church, specifically the battle that John Lackland and Pope Innocent III fought over the See of Canterbury. The Archbishop of Canterbury, Hubert Walter, died on 13 July 1205 AD. King John wanted John de Grey, Bishop of Norwich, to take over the See of Canterbury. But the church bishop wanted a guy called Reginald. There was a bit of a mess where the bishop sent Reginald to be confirmed in Rome and John forced them to change their votes to support John de Grey and various other shenanigans. In the end, Pope Innocent III disavowed Reginald and John de Grey and appointed his own candidate, Stephen Langton. This made King John furious. He did not want to recognize the Pope's authority in appointing the Archbishop. And so he banned Langton from entering England. Pope Innocent, in return, placed the whole of England under interdict. What this means is that any religious ceremony except baptism and absolution for the dying is forbidden. In return, John started to seize church land in England, and he and Innocent waged war for the hearts and minds of the people of England. The battle was a long one, but it was one that Innocent won, and in the end, King John was forced to swear allegiance to Innocent, turning England into a feudal state for the Pope. The larger Europe took note of the power of the papacy and the church, and though the Pope would never officially hold the title of ruler of Europe, the influence of the church was vast enough that Europe during this time period is an interesting study as a theocracy by proxy. In fantasy, this kind of government is used, is used by George R. R. Martin in Westeros. The faith of the seven is very clearly influential in the kingdom of Westeros. And it becomes more so as the books progress, especially with the rise of the faith militant, which is the sparrows. Martin shows this rise with the sparrows becoming the poor fellows in the later books. From a world-building perspective, what's really interesting is that the influence of the faith increases because the sects were despoiled in the War of the Five Kings. This angered the faithful and they gave more support to the sparrows who were the people speaking out against this action and demanding justice. The high sparrow, as he came to be called, rode that popularity into office and he convinced Circe to overturn an ancient law that forbade the faithful from arming. You see, the Targaryen king, Maegor, understood that having a power center that was not his own and was authorized to do violence was dangerous to the authority of the crown. 
And that's exactly what the faith militant represented. And we see that danger borne out in the books. These holy warriors usurp the power of the state and they already hold the authority of the faith. They erode the power of the crown every day. And if the matter were to run its course, it is likely that Westeros would over time become a more theocratic-like state. Martin's work is an interesting look at a faith becoming more militant, more expansionistic and starting to erode civil authority with a view towards the church taking on the role of the state. It's a very interesting read from that perspective. So how do you actually create the required setup where a theocracy would be the natural form of government for a given culture? One of the things that you do need to pay attention to when you're building a theocracy is that your religion has to be expansionistic. It can't sit at home and knit socks. Religions that sit at home and knit socks don't answer to the needs of a country or a nation or a government to be expansionistic and hence don't make good candidates for a theocracy. So it needs to be a religion that can recruit more people. And you can see this in Raymond Faist's latest work, which is a book series not set in Metchemia, where in the first book, you can see the spread of a new faith, the faith of the one God, slowly absorbing all of the pantheons around it as people are converted to the worship of the one God. And that kind of expansionistic Religion lends itself very well to a theocracy. Your God needs to be okay with what is going on. You can't have the God be not okay with it and be an interfery God and let the theocracy happen. One of these things is going to have to give. So either your God is a not interfery God or he's okay with what's being done in his name. Remember, your government is both church and state. That means your pomp, your ceremony, your etiquette needs to be to the nth degree. It is going to be even worse than a noble court or a, mon or a monarchic order. If you want some inspiration for court etiquette, check out my video over there. Finally, you can't have a tolerant society and have a theocracy. As I discussed previously, theocracies become oppressive. It's the nature of being both a religion and a government. If you cannot question, you cannot have tolerance. And that is my take on theocracies. I hope that you have enjoyed this video. I will see you soon for another one. Join the conversation in Discord and do give this video a thumbs up. Thank you very much. See you soon.